am very honored to kick off this exhibit. Um, as Linda mentioned, this was a vision two years ago for me when I dug out when I dug out this old book that I had made. I had been a campus cartoonist. I graduated in 1988, and I was struggling to start a career when news of the strike reached me. I saw the headline that I'm sure you all saw. You know, with a bit crying. But when I came back, I found that I found where the media saw hysterical women, I saw hysterical women. <laughs> so inside the Mills Revolution um, was a collection of cartoons I drew. I just came back and I drew what I saw. Um, it's, it shows the history of the 10 days that changed Mills forever by making it go back to being the same. Um, two years ago, I decided to pull together the remnants of my cartoony career into a memoir, um, since I'm more of a writer now. Um, which is perfectly revolting, my glamorous cartoony career. It contains, it sort of leads up to the Mills Revolution in the very back pages. So I have, I have volunteers passing them out. Yeah, it's a great audio visual. You guys um, can look, look through it as I read. Um, it came out in this spring, and Linda threw me the most perfectly revolting tea party um, at Reinhardt for the book launch, which is the start of the series of events that brought us to this weekend. Um, it's, yeah, and it's just wonderful to have a chance to reflect as a community on the meaning of those 10 days. You know, we've all thought about it a lot. I, you know, do about it a lot, uh, talk about it a lot, but it's really wonderful to feel like, okay, it wasn't just me. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Um, if you notice the cover, there is a special limited edition that only that has a, a, a strike anniversary cover. Um, I only had 100 of those printed, so um, you can get them today, tomorrow, and in the bookstore, and then hopefully they'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll be worth millions. You can pass them down to your, you know, for generations. Yeah. Your um, so this book, um, the original, is reprinted on starting on page 101. And uh, I'm, for those of you, now how many of you are um, new students or parents visiting and know very little about the strike? Okay, for your benefit, I'm just going to read to you the, the introduction to this because it, it explains, you know, what the deal is all about. In the academic year of 1880, 18, <laughs> <laughs> a century ago, 90, Mills College began an intensive self-survey to determine its strengths and weaknesses and help to position it as an independent liberal arts college entering the 21st century. It was determined that the college would need to increase enrollment in order to compete with comparable institutions and maintain its health in the long run. As it has in single-sex institutions since women first demanded publication, the debate rose uh, whether or not to go co-ed. Mary Metz, the president of Mills and the figurehead of cheerful self-composure and perfect care, <laughs> invited debate from all sectors of the community. Although almost everyone felt Mills was in need of some change, most did not believe the co-ed option was to be taken seriously. Three weeks before graduation, the fate of the college was to be revealed. Astonishing the entire community, chairman of the board, Warren Hellman, announced that men would be admitted as undergraduates of Mills in the fall of 1990. The response was a wail heard around the world. It was a voice of outrage at the betrayal of Mills' 138-year history and commitment as an institution for women's education. The board's decision showed little faith in Mills' identity and potential. The students shut the campus down, blocking entry to every administrative office, and politely requested that the decision be reversed. <laughs> <laughs> the strike attacked, attracted the attention of the national media, which sparked debate throughout the country on women's education, sexism, and the nebulous state of the women's movement. On campus, the level of organization was remarkable. Decisions were made by consensus, with runners from each blockaded doorway meeting again and again at headquarters until the entire campus was in agreement. One alone thus provided walkie-talkies that made spontaneous action possible. One night, for example, when a secret meeting was called at the president's house, cars were called from all over campus to honk it out, making so much noise that communication was in was impossible. <laughs> the entire community mobilized to show its commitment. Within 10 days, the Alumni Association had raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep Mills a women's college. 
The trustees have presented with proposals from every quarter of the community to meet its needs and goals without selling out. Images appeared and repeated. One strike t-shirt played on the Timeless Mills motto, remember who you are and what you represent. Yeah. It read, the students remember, the staff remember, the faculty remember, the alumni remember, the administration forgot. <laughs> and of course you can see it in the beautiful display case. The rest of course is history. After a two week siege, the board reversed the tent's decision and blockaders went home to take showers. <laughs> <laughs> this is the eyewitness journal of the strike by a roving cartoonist who started her career at Mills. On this page, on page 103, I have, I have a little symbol um, uh, that represents the consensus building. Um, the question goes out to all the different parts. Question, answer, answer. And then on page 116, you can see the results where all the answers, the exclamation points come back to the center. On the back page, there's my most favorite quote of all. I think this is Heather Cox, a creative genius, who said, we had a revolution. There was child care, there was consensus, we sent thank you notes, we cleaned up our, after ourselves, and we won. We won. And just now, just today, I also found out that the, um, the revolution was also catered. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> so I'll read you guys a few cartoons, and then I'll let you um, get on to, you know, checking out all the amazing um, collection that we have here. So, page 104, May. 3rd, 1990, after the Board of Trustees meeting. Warren, go to hell, man, says, <laughs> so, what do you think will happen when I announce the co-ed decision tomorrow? Mary, perfect hair met, says, the oh, <laughs> girls will be pretty disappointed. Um, someone else, a named trustee, says, there will be, there will most likely be protests. Statistics show, Wheaton Goucher and Sarah Lawrence students were all upset when they went co-ed. Maybe we should form a committee to organize grief counseling. It's a normal, healthy process, dealing with the law. <laughs> May 4th, 1990, two hours after the decision is announced. Well, now, well, Mary, looks like we empowered a few too many women a little too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just point out that um, in these pictures, you might notice how tall Mary Ness's hair was. <laughs> um, the other thing about this polite revolution was there was a remarkable lack of name calling and it was uh, aside from the obvious you know war and go to hell man which you know mm -hmm. had to be said <laughs> we had to think of that one it was perfect um but uh I, I had to really you know this is my first foray into political cartooning and i really had to find a symbol to represent you know the the depth of the confusion and the magnitude of the betrayal that um, students felt here, and and so you know, since there was a lot of head shaving going on, um, I thought hair would be a really good symbol, especially because Mary, um, being the Southern belle that she was, always had amazing, delightfully you know smooth hair. <laughs> <laughs> so her hair grows and grows through <laughs> this whole story. And as a matter of fact, um, um, I think it's what originally got my um, got my book banned uh, after it came out. I, I was so excited to sell it in the bookstore, and then I got a, a call from someone in the administration who I had known and worked with um, as a in my student job, and I thought she was calling to congratulate me on this book, but she told me I had to take it out of the bookstore, and it was. Just Devastating to have my first book banned. <laughs> so I called a friend and said, Oh my god, how lucky are you? <laughs> what great company you're in. But feelings were, were still very raw that summer, and even though I don't think I was all that mean to Mary, I could understand, you know, why they <laughs> why they didn't want it around. It was back in it was back in the bookstore by um, the end of the summer. And it's definitely there now. So um Page 106, The Mills Revolution. I have a couple of cartoons showing the front lines and backstage. Um, the students are in tents saying, obviously they've been plotting to go co-ed from the start. Why do you say that? Well, they've never bothered to officially call us underclass women or fresh women, and I don't think they do now either. <laughs> and there's condom machines in the grill bathroom, but still no tampax dispensers in the dorm. <laughs> are there any students who can 
can tell me if this has changed. <laughs> um, backstage, who wants to go pick up lunch? I'm going off campus. I'd be happy to do it. You're doing a historical thing, you know. What do you mean? During the student takeovers in the 60s, going for sandwiches while the men held down the fort was a task most often delegated to us. You've come a long way, babe. <laughs> Um, and then I have a, uh, a picture on page 108 of the, the woman energy chant, which I think there's a whole book about this because they were going, women energy, women energy, and then some people start going, women energy, women energy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my, my aunt, uh, I'm a bent twig. I'm a, like a second generation bent twig, right, Murray? 